friends uh, welcome back to nri samay this is uh, shri hari your host uh, for today's show uh, we have an incredible guest today uh, her name is uh, ritika kera and um, so she she is an uh, indian economist and a social activist uh, she has a phd from delhi school of economics uh, she was a student um, of the noted economist and activist uh, john drace uh, she is a visitor at uh, center for development uh, economics delhi school of economics and uh, she does research on uh, nrega and uh, pds and other social issues we'll talk all about those and uh, she is currently teaching in uh, iit new delhi uh, welcome uh, ritika ji how are you i'm fine thanks thanks for having me uh to begin with uh, you are a professor in uh, new delhi uh, iit mm-hmm. new delhi but uh, you do um, research on the rural issues also so how is it possible i mean because uh, new delhi is such a big uh, big city and uh, so how do you get uh, to know about the rural issues <laughs> i bunk my classes and i run away <laughs> okay <laughs> no so actually a lot of the work that i've been doing in rural areas uh much of it happened before i got a job and in fact i postponed getting a job precisely for this season so that i would have the freedom to be able to do all my field work i see so uh, where uh, where did you focus your uh, field work at uh, what areas um so basically i've been doing this kind of work for the past 10 years and i started with my phd work in rajasthan that was uh, 2001 to 2004 uh, but since then we've uh, done quite a lot of work in the other hindi speaking states so that's up jharkhand chatisgarh especially and to some extent even himachal pradesh and bihar um and uh, then we then we were really brave we also went to the non hindi speaking states including tamil nadu orissa a uh, little bit in kerala and andhra pradesh okay excellent so you pretty much uh, covered entire uh, india well i'm getting there <laughs> <laughs> okay okay uh, we'll talk about uh, various issues but i want to start off with the food security issue uh, because uh-huh. um, there is a significant amount of indians who don't get uh, proper food nutritional food and uh, they are uh-huh. they're suffering do you think this is a uh, more uh, prevalent in urban areas or rural areas mm, so if you look at the national statistics like from the national family health survey you do find that the problem is somewhat more serious in rural areas uh, but that of course doesn't mean that there isn't a problem in urban areas as well because i think here uh, perhaps people are able to you know get jobs that give them access to better food but they have to suffer many other hardships which uh, perhaps they which are less uh, serious in rural areas so in terms of better housing or sanitation facilities so i i guess at the end of the day um, it's a little bit hard to say how serious the problem is but uh, by and large if you look at the indian population you do find that Uh, nutrition is a big problem and it's related to very poor diet i see but uh, i mean the way we knew about uh, villages at least um, uh, at least i'm talking about myself they were supposed to be self sufficient and uh, um, they they had enough resources to live their life without depending much on the government uh, but uh, it, has this changed uh, uh, in last few decades or has it always been like that uh, i'm talking about the villages and rural area so uh, it's slightly difficult to make one sort of grand statement about how villages are across the country because i do think there are very significant variations um but i think what is certainly true is that there is a lot of inequality um in terms of access to resources so overall even though villages may be self sufficient uh, there is a very serious problem with uh, respect to distribution of resources yeah and then in the indian context in most parts of the country i would say 
uh, these sorts of problems are compounded. So there is the economic inequality, which is compounded by social inequality, by which I mean, uh, you know, caste issues and gender especially. <coughs> so, so women things are tough, tend to be tougher. And certainly for Dalits and tribal people, things are very difficult, especially if they're in mixed uh, villages. I see, I see. So the government's role remains pretty crucial, and I think that's 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 sort of true across the world. That for certain sorts of services, public services, that the government does step in. Whether you talk about so-called capitalist countries like England or France or Switzerland, you know, health and education <clears throat> are uh, things that that where the government plays a very important role. And in fact. Certainly in France, it's in the Constitution, in England, you know, the National Health Service, which people may criticize, but still it does deliver reasonably well, is also uh, there through an act of government. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about the government's role a little bit more, but um, in the village, before that, in villages, um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, migration uh, happening, uh, yes. I think, for a few decades. There a lot of people are moving. I mean, we hardly find any young generation in um, the villages. So how is this because of the similar issues? And when they actually go to the cities, uh, is it mm -hmm. getting better for them? Or is it, uh, like you mentioned, is it just uh, different issues? Uh, so <laughs> again, you're asking me very difficult questions, and I don't always have answers to these things. Now, as far as migration is concerned, I think it, like if you ask me about the age distribution of migrants, I would find it very hard to say whether, you know, the young people have all abandoned the villages and are looking to move to the cities. I think migration, uh, rural urban migration is pretty significant, but so is rural, rural migration. And in fact, in India, I think a, a very large chunk of migration is related to marriage, that women move when they get married. Even that gets classified as migration. Yeah, so there's that sort of migration. Then there is the sort of migration that we really worry about, which is what you are hinting at, which is distress migration, that people have just not got opportunities where they are, and so they want to get out and go to places where the economy is more diversified and perhaps where there are more opportunities. But then there is the migration of the sort that I'm guessing you're based in the U.S., that, that your kind of migration, which is a full factor, that you have gone because you have better opportunities there. And I, if you are, I don't really work that much on migration, but, you know, the entire gamut of migration is a mix of all these different types. And I'm not sure which one is the largest one. But distress migration is certainly a very worrying thing because when people come to these cities, they don't know if they'll get jobs. So they have to invest quite a bit of money in looking for work, even if it's to just work at a construction site. They may get work for one day and be, you know, just hanging around for the next few days. They don't have a proper place to stay. For women, things, of course, are much tougher because they may also be exploited. Uh, in their workplace in different sorts of ways. Even male workers worry about whether or not they'll be paid by contractors if they've taken advances uh, before coming because, you know, sometimes at times of festivals, they're given advances by contractors who bring them to the cities. Uh, so then, you know, it's almost like being tied and bonded to that particular person. So there are a whole range of issues related to migration which are quite serious. But in the overall picture, I, w I don't know, you know, whether marriage is the most uh, frequent form of migration or whether, whether it's the NRI migration, which is very big, or whether it's this distress migration. So in Kerala, for instance, you know, a lot of people go to the Gulf countries, and that certainly, I mean, it doesn't seem as uh, distressing as the people who come and live on roads in Delhi or Bombay. You yeah. say you're not, uh, your research is not here, but you, you're able to talk about it. Uh, but there's other kind of migration I'll, I would like to mention very briefly, is uh, yeah. when, uh, especially when uh, government leaves out these uh, maybe mines, then uh, uh, the tribal people get evacuated from there. Uh, we had 
done a few yes. shows on those things. And also when they build these um, uh, projects, uh, water projects, dams, and they yes. forced to leave their uh, habitat and go somewhere else. So, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. basically displacement, right? Where people are getting displaced from their, uh, you know, places that they have lived in because the, somebody has to pay the price for development yeah. or what what is generally called development. Yeah, and that also induces a certain type of migration. You're right. Um, Ritika ji, then um, you, I, I, I don't think it's widely discussed yet, but I think uh, the UPA government uh, uh, is uh, coming up with the Food Security Act under uh, Sonia Gandhi's his, uh, leadership. Um, are you aware of that? Yes, yes, of course. We are waiting for for this to happen. <laughs> so, uh, for uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, I just lost the thought on that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so the idea is. Um, every person in India will have access uh, to the to food, right? Basically, so that's the idea of the Food Security Act. Yeah, in a sense, uh, you could say that. So basically, what the Food Security Act is aiming to do is to make legal entitlements certain government schemes which are already on the ground. Yeah. So we have the public distribution system which provides subsidized grain pulses uh, and edible oil in some states, uh, but at least the grain component is across the country. Then there is the midday meal program, which is like a school meal program. Children get uh, one meal uh, if they go to government schools. Then there is the Anganwadi, the Integrated Child Development Services Scheme, where children under the age of six can go and spend a few hours and they get some supplementary nutrition. Pregnant and lactating mothers get some uh, you know, additional uh, nutritive food for for their special requirements. So there are a whole range of schemes like that, which are going to be brought uh, under the, the Food Security Act, and they will be made legal entitlements. So in that sense, yes, the Food Security Act is aiming to reach out and to make sure that nobody sleeps hungry in this country. So all the current uh, programs uh, will come under mm -hmm. the uh, Food Security Act and in one way or the other, um, uh, everybody should have so the, Yeah, so the ones that are in the current act which was tabled last year in December in Parliament is, uh, is the ICDS program, the Midday Meal Scheme, Public Distribution System, Maternity Entitlements, and then there is a provision for community kitchens. So, you know, when like uh, cycle rickshaw uh, pullers and even construction laborers who don't have, you know, when they are in the city as migrants, for people like that when everything else fails, they should have somewhere to go to and get a nutritious meal at a reasonable price. So that would be through community kitchens. So those are the schemes that would come under the Food Security Act. I see. And and uh, so public distribution system is going to be the key factor uh, in in this one right one of the key factors yes certainly one of the key factors and um, yeah and uh, do you think there is a need uh, or more need now to kind of improve the pds uh, because of uh, uh, this because this is going to be even more uh, i mean challenging mega scale uh, projects like this one do you think yeah, uh, so, the pds um, is capable as it is right now um, so like i said earlier you know there are a lot of very important variations in the implementation of the pds across the country so there are states like tamil nadu where the pds runs as a universal scheme where even IIT professors like me would be entitled to 20 kilos of free grain, plus uh, a range of other commodities, including uh, rava and um, uh, dal and oil and things like that. So that's one one uh, example. That's uh, incidentally that's also one of the states where corruption and leakages from the PDS are very small. So, for instance, if you look at the National Sample Survey data from 
you find that of all the grain that the state government of Tamil Nadu took from uh, the central government, only 4% did not find its way into people's homes, that the mismatch is very small. Whereas um, then on the other hand, you have states like Bihar where things are still uh, quite bad. Even though, even in the state of Bihar in the past five years, there has been an improvement. So Bihar runs what is called a targeted public distribution system where only people who are supposedly below the poverty line will get a BPL card and only those who have a BPL card are entitled to subsidized grain and the rest of the population is not. So, they, so basically at the moment I think about 50% at most of the rural population of Bihar has BPL cards and they are entitled to it, but there are lots of leakages from the system. So in Bihar, the leakage rate has gone from 90% in 2004-05 to about 75%. But in between, you'll find a whole range of uh, experiences. Yeah. So the states which are like Tamil Nadu in terms of very low leakages and a functional CDS are uh, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Himachal Pradesh. And then there are some states which used to be like Bihar but are increasingly becoming like Tamil Nadu. So in that category, I would put Chhattisgarh, Orissa, Rajasthan. So for just to give you a sense of the sort of improvement we have seen in these past five years, the leakage rate in uh, Orissa has gone from 75% to 33%. Yeah, that's a huge improvement. In um, uh, similarly, in Chhattisgarh, the leakage rate has gone from 50% to just 10%. Uh, so what's happening is that a lot of state governments are beginning to understand that this is a good scheme and it can even win them elections. So they have been uh, thinking very hard about how to improve the system. So I feel that you know, if uh, if the central government is um, is interested in the program, it certainly can uh, make it run across the country the way it does in Tamil Nadu and Himachal Pradesh. So you are saying the the PDA system is currently in the state government's purview, but it's going to go under the central government, right? And uh, the no, so it it's on. I mean, both are involved. The grain is provided by the central government. But well, implementation is very much in the hands of state governments. Yeah, and what has ha started happening is also that, you know, some states are really fed up. But the way the system works at the moment is that the central government tells the state government that according to us, this is your poverty rate. Yeah, so suppose they tell uh, Chhattisgarh that 40% of your rural population is poor and we give you enough grain for 40% of the rural population. Now you go and identify who these 40% are. What Chhattisgarh state government finds is that actually 80% are uh, in need of this kind of subsidized food grain. Yeah. So basically their shoe size is 8 and they are being told by the central government to wear a shoe that's size 4. And whenever they try to do that it obviously hurts and they end up getting a lot of flack from, you know, from the poor who are left out of the system. So what many states have uh, started doing, including Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, is that they have started adding their own money to the uh, to the scheme, and they said it doesn't matter, we'll take grain for 40% from the central government, and the rest of the money we'll put in from our own side so that we are able to cover everyone who needs it. Okay, excellent. Um, but you, it's uh, it's funny you mentioned Andhra Pradesh in a positive side, but uh, but one figure I know uh, is mm -hmm. in Andhra Pradesh we have about um, two crore families, so that's uh, close mm -hmm. to uh, nine crore people. But there are uh, almost uh, three crore uh, uh, the white cards which are given. Cash and card. No, no, so, yeah. So it's a lot of. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where you get that. Yeah, no, but I'm not sure where you get that number from. You have to send me the source of this data for me to be able to believe it, because I have heard a similar statistic for Karnataka. In fact, it's in a book, uh, in a published book, which doesn't give any source for this sort of information. And I think it's a very good thing that 
people are constantly asking questions about corruption and the sort of you know the the sort of statistic that you have brought up. But I also feel that when we do this sort of thing, we must do it responsibly and uh, make sure that we are not just perpetuating a myth. Right. I mean, I saw it in newspapers, so I can uh, send it uh, offline to you. One of the links. At least I. Yeah, that would be good. So it's not. Yeah, because you know, this is uh, this is actually uh, this is obviously quite a serious issue, right? If if it is true that there are only two crore families and there are na three crore ration cards, then this is really something that the that the state government should be cracking down on. But I think it's also equally our responsibility to make sure that we document these sorts of corruption cases with uh, great care so that they're not just backing up the wrong tree. Right. Right. And no, the reason I brought this up is uh, because mm -hmm. uh, from from this state to get to a yeah. better state, um, yeah. especially because now if we are implementing Food Security Act, is there okay. any uh, for example, I don't. I'm not. I don't know about Tamil Nadu, but uh, if it is uh, such a good model, uh, what yeah. does it take from uh, for a system in Bihar to get into a state of uh, Tamil Nadu's uh, thing? Yeah. So uh, actually, you know, what has happened is that uh, Tamil Nadu, in a sense, was the pioneer in uh, you know making the PDS work, and one of the most important things about uh, Tamil Nadu's success is that people are always questioning. So, in fact, I'm sure if you have any Tamil, uh, you know, listeners, they are going to say she's just talking rubbish, and they'll all have uh, ten stories to tell you, or at least two stories to tell you of some in, uh, corruption that they have encountered. But uh, if you look at the overall picture, and especially compared to the North Indian states, Tamil Nadu has done a very good job uh, of implementing these social welfare programs. Not just the PDS actually, but even the midday meal scheme, ICDS, and public health. Uh, in the case of the PDS, let's look at what they did. Uh, one of the things that has, which I think a lot of you know urban middle class, certainly in India, I don't know about abroad. Uh, what we like to call populist scheme. They reduced the price to two rupees. Jala, uh, Karna Nidhi came made it one rupee. Jalalita came made it zero. Yeah, but in fact, what has happened is as a result of the reduction of price over the years. Not so uh, certainly in Tamil Nadu, but even more importantly in states like Odisha and Chhattisgarh, which have copied this model, is that it has created a very strong interest in the PDS on the part of the poor. These poor who are disempowered people or at least uh, relatively voiceless compared to the ration dealer who runs the shop, when the rice is only one or two rupees, they, they're, uh, they're, the way they think is almost as if, you know, let him beat me up today. Even if the dealer curses me, you know, swears at me, even if he beats me up, physically beats me up, I'm not going to let that two rupee rice go. And so they started fighting for the rice. That's one thing that's helped. The second thing that helped is that in Tamil Nadu, it's a universal system. So people like you and me would also be interested in the functioning of the ration shop. And when people like you and me who are educated, who are voice, and who can go and complain about people, when we are interested in a system, then we make sure that that system works. Yeah. So when you move towards a universal model, what happens is that you increase the pressure on the system to work by bringing in a very powerful constituency into the system. And the, a similar sort of thing, you know, applies even in the case of education, that if people like you and me were going to government schools, then government schools would not have been in the sort of sorry state that they are in some parts of the country today. It's because we have checked out and we have found our easy way to go to, you know, maybe missionary schools or whatever it is, that the, it leads to a collapse of that system. That's another thing that helps. And then very importantly, uh, Tamil Nadu and all these other states that I've been mentioning, Kerala, Andhra, Himachal, Chhattisgarh, Orissa, have been using technology very in a very uh, uh, clever manner. So they've computerized all their systems, which has made corruption very difficult. Uh, in, uh, in Tamil Nadu, in fact, you know, they have a system where every day you can check for every shop what is the stock of rice, wheat, 
uh, dal, oil, rava, whatever it is that they're selling. Yeah. So for shop wise and commodity wise, you can get a stock uh, to see what's happening with the sales over there. Um, and that corrupt, uh, you know, this computerization has also helped in the case of Chhattisgarh to weed out the problem that you were just mentioning. You know, when there are too many cards and duplicate cards. So when they started computerizing the system, they also did a sort of verification exercise and they found that about 8% cards uh, were duplicates. Like they were either people who had died or whether, you know, I'm entitled only to one card but I managed to get two cards. So they found that about there was excess of 8% of cards and they were able to get rid of those. Um, another measure uh, that has helped quite a bit is, you know, what uh, earlier what used to happen is that the fashion shops would be done by private dealers and these private dealers were basically in cahoots with politicians. So the politicians would turn a blind eye when the dealers were cheating poor people and basically the dealers would then, you know, recycle some of their profits back to these politicians for that sort of favor. So in many states they started taking away these private dealerships uh, from uh, private persons and handing over the running of the ration shop to gram panchayat or to self-help groups or in the case of Tamil Nadu and Himachal Pradesh the whole system is in the hands of the registrar of cooperative societies and then this this entity which is a government entity they appoint salespersons to run these ration shops. Yeah, so basically now I mean I'm not saying that the gram panchayat is not corrupt. I mean, even they can be corrupt, but somehow it's made it easier for the poor people to fight fight back. They're less scared of fighting back with the dealers than they were, uh, uh, sorry, uh, fighting back the gram panchayas than they were with dealers. So there's like a whole package uh, <laughs> of reform measures which has traveled from Tamil Nadu to Andhra to Chhattisgarh to Orissa, now to Rajasthan and Jharkhand also. Uh, which has had to revive the PDS. I see. Excellent. Um, um, one of our listeners uh, on chat, uh, they were asking, um, is there any focus on the north-eastern uh, states? Uh, is it, um, I guess she's asking whether it's uh, any different right. from the rest of the India. Yeah. You know, I'm, uh, I'm sadly ashamed to say that I've never really been uh, to any of those parts of the country and I'm almost clueless and, you know, ignorant about how things work there. Every now and then we do get to hear good things, like Sikkim is supposed to be implementing some of these programs really well. In Tripura you get good reports about uh, the implementation of the Employment Guarantee Act, but as far as the PDS is concerned, I'm sorry, I don't really know how things are over there. Okay, that's uh, fair enough. Um, the um, when Food Security Act, uh, I mean, when Food Security comes to mind, uh, one of the uh, things that also ring a bell is about the genetically modified food, and uh, people yeah. say that. Um, this this is one way to create more food, and so mm -hmm. so it kind of addresses the uh, uh, food security issue. Do you do you think uh, that's the way we should go? <laughs> Again, you know, this uh, GM foods are not something that I personally work on at all, so I would be quite hesitant to say anything about something that I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. So I'll I'll pass that one. <laughs> okay, okay, sure. But I I'll ha I'll ask one more question at the same. Uh, yeah. But the I mean, bec just because you traveled and you in the rural areas and you kind of have a direct interaction with um, with uh, with rural people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What are farmers saying? Uh, if, if at all this uh, come up this came up uh, in your discussions. What are farmers saying about uh, the GM food? Do you think uh, it's hurting them or it's uh, helping? I'm afraid again, you know, this is not the sort of thing that we have been investigating. Like our focus has been very much on food security programs, employment guarantee. So we tend to kind of, you know, really go into great detail into those things. 
and GM crop somehow we have never really had any uh, direct sort of conversations about it. But now that you mention it and you're making me look foolish, next time we're in the field I'll make sure to talk to <laughs> some people about this. No, 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 I'm sorry, I mean, I, I did want to... No, 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 I'm joking. I know you're not. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, but but uh, then one of your favorite uh, subjects, I guess, is the Employment Guarantee Scheme, right? Um, yeah, so how that is I can that, talk about. <laughs> how, how is that uh, working out? Uh, we Once in a while we hear about uh, the misuse of the program, like, uh, with any other program, but uh, specific to employment guarantee, is it uh, kind of a success? I, I guess it's success in a lot of areas, but not in some areas. Yeah. Can you go over it? Yeah. So I think what has happened actually is that in the past year or two, uh, expenditure on NREG on this Employment Guarantee Act has actually gone down quite dramatically. Um, and it's not really obvious why that is happening. I know the government's explanation here is that uh, this is an indication of the success of the program. It's quite funny, actually. So what they say is that um, that NREG is there only when people demand the work, and if the expenditure is going down, that, that is an indication that the demand for NREG work has gone down. I don't think that's true at all. I think there is quite a lot of demand for NREG work which is not being met. And uh, I think that there is a bit of a squeeze from the side of the government on uh, NREG expenditure. As far as the implementation is concerned, apart from this crash in employment level in the past two years, which is quite worrying, uh, you are exactly right when you say that, you know, in some areas it's working quite well and that in other areas it's not. So, you know, there are states like uh, Gujarat and Raj Maharashtra where I think the average is still below 10. Um, and, you know, you you might say, okay, fine, these are industrialized states and there isn't a demand for work. But there are also states like Bihar which are quite poor and still quite rural, you know, Agri uh, agriculture dominated, then again the average days has barely crawled, above, you know, into the two-digit uh, figure. But on the other hand, you have states like Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, even Himachal actually is doing quite a good job uh, of implementing this program. But then again, you know, <laughs> there are different parameters on which you could evaluate it. So what days of work is one thing. Another way of looking at it is the participation of women, you know, which states, uh, in which states are women able to participate. And there again you find Kerala and Tamil Nadu, I think it's between 80 and 90 percent women's participation. And I think for the women who get this work, it really does mean uh, quite a lot. A third criteria on which you could evaluate the program is corruption levels. Uh, another one is the creation of assets. To what extent are we able to create assets uh, in rural areas with this sort of program? And, uh, you know, we were involved in a, a very small study in uh, in Harkhan where we found that the wells that are being constructed uh, through NREG um, are actually yielding very good results for the people on whose farms these wells are constructed. Uh, so it really depends on... Uh, on what parameter you want to evaluate the program and then you'll find different patterns for different parameters. Right. Uh, one of the factors you mentioned is um, building assets. So the, the, these projects, uh, the idea is to build uh, local projects, right? And um, mm -hmm. so do you get a sense that uh, these, are, uh, these are helping the villages to thrive and have some sort of long-term solutions and also um, is this part of the economy uh, growth uh, within the villages? Hmm. So on that, I would say that the potential is massive, that, you know, we really, we could do quite a lot of uh, improvement in the rural, in rural infrastructure through NREGA, but at the same time, uh, and actually, you know, in the same vein, that a lot of the works that are undertaken through NREG are work that the people appreciate. So whether it's uh, the making of a new road 
or whether it's desilting a canal or a pond or it's the, whether it's construction of wells or it's land leveling and what is called mirbandi, you know, this making the, you know, terracing of fields for paddy cultivation. Uh, so all these works are things that people really value. The problem is that we don't have enough staff in uh, these rural areas, technical staff who could actually supervise the work well enough. So because of lack of supervision or lack of technical expertise, some of these works are not as good as they could have been. So that certainly is a very important problem in the implementation of NREG at the moment. That's a very good point. Uh, maybe the government can send uh, the staff, uh, the the technical staff uh, to oversee these things. So. Yeah. Uh, or if we have people who are inspired by Swadesh and some engineers from there can come back and work here. <laughs> um, so the NREGA, I think uh, one of the uh, issue, uh, the complaints that farmers will probably make is that uh, the agriculture labor is uh, taken away from them and we already know that uh, the agriculture labor is uh, a scarcity. Now because of uh, this they are even taken away and they would probably be more appreciative if uh, agriculture also included in this, uh, in this uh, program. What would you say? Yeah, so I think <laughs> that NREG was meant to create new employment opportunities, yeah, and to prevent the exploitation of labor which has been going on for, for you know, decades or if not centuries <laughs> in this country, yeah. So what NREG has done is that it has, uh, you know, made that sort of exploitation very difficult. Let me give you an example. In 2005, we were in a district called Sonbhadra in uh, Eastern UP. And there we met a couple who had worked for 28 days on, you know, at that time there was something called the National Food for Work Program. And for that 28 days of work, both of them together had, had been given 58 rupees or something like that. Yeah, and that sort of exploitation today is almost unimaginable anywhere in the country. And for the first time, people in rural areas have begun to understand that there is something called a government rate or a minimum wage, that the Minimum Wage Act, which was passed in 1948, has only been violated, I think, in rural areas. You know, it was just unheard of that people would actually get the minimum wage. So it's true that labor costs are going up, but, you know, it's also true that the labor costs are going up because they have been exploited all these years and you know our uh, comfortable lives or whatever it is that at least to some extent is on the back of their labor and if we you know if we care about inclusive growth yeah and if we care about making sure that everyone you know that there's some sort of equity equality in the country the only way we can achieve that is if the incomes of the poorest sections of the population grow at a much faster rate than the incomes of the richest or at least the middle. And in fact, actually, that it's exactly the opposite in India, that the incomes of the richest are growing at a very high rate and the incomes of the poorest are growing, but they're growing at a very slow rate of growth. So I think to that extent, uh, you know, NREG has played an important role and I would therefore not support bringing agriculture under NREGA because that will again push them back into the hands of these, you know, earlier exploitative sort of uh, relationships. Right, uh, but uh, when you talk about poor, it's not just the poor labor, right? Even the farmers are one, uh, I mean, they, yes. they are the poorest yeah. section of the people. Now, uh, yeah. it's this is not helping them anyway. It's, uh, you can say it's kind of hurting. You can say it's less exploitation or no exploitation, but it's uh, if you look at the poor farmer, it uh, this this is hurting them. Don't you think so? Yeah, no, I yeah, no. So I think that the agricultural policy in this country has certainly uh, been neglected for a very long time, and we do need to uh, you know look at these issues. Farmer uh, farming costs or the costs that are faced by you know farming is no longer a 
profitable sort of exercise as far as I can tell. And uh, a lot of the marginal, you know, 80% are small or marginal farmers. But their rising costs, you know, labor is just one component. There are many other components in which the government uh, could play a more supportive role. I would say that, you know, I still feel that uh, since the aim of NREG was to create a sort of floor below which wages would not go and to create additional employment for the really, you know, the landless are even worse off than small and marginal farmers. So I feel like this is their chance and we should not take it away from them. Right. While sympathizing with the woes of farming, you know, farming communities, especially these dry land farmers who, who are really going through tough times. Yeah. But I think that the solution to that problem is not NREG. Yeah, that the solution to that problem lies in really understanding what is it that ails agriculture today. Right. Um, yeah, it, yeah, as you mentioned, it's only a um, part of it. There's a lot of other issues. But I want to uh, mention one thing. That traditionally, I think uh, the way we looked at farmers is they are from most of them were from upper caste and the laborer was from the lower caste. But I think most mm -hmm. of the farmers now are actually from lower caste because it's not, uh, as you mentioned, it's not a, a profitable um, Yeah, so, you know, I don't know about the caste aspect, the caste composition of farmers, you know, small and large farmers, but I think it's certainly true that, you know, the sort of rich farmers that you saw perhaps 20 years ago, that is becoming more and more uh, uncommon. I mean, I think in the northwestern part of the country, the Punjab, Haryana, perhaps. But even there, you hear about farmer suicides and death and, uh, you know, unsustainability of that sort of agricultural model. So, yeah. So I think I partly at least agree with you. Um, so I'll go back to Food Security Act. Uh, just two more questions. I know it's uh, late in India. Um, but this is... a. Uh, I don't get to talk about these issues with uh, many guests, so I'm kind of dumping them all on you. <laughs> um, actually, we tried to bring uh, John Reyes, uh, so hopefully he'll be on the radio soon. I will let you know. Okay. Um, yeah. So the Food Security Act, uh, I went through the uh, document, uh, one of the versions. It doesn't. Uh, I should maybe not necessarily, but uh, I was hoping they they would put some uh, verbiage into what the long term solution is, uh, because uh, most the begins kind of with saying a lot of people don't get nutrition food. But don't you think it yeah. should kind of address what is a long term solution? Of course, government providing food is uh, is one way, but that's not how. Yeah. Uh, people want to leave, right? They want to have their own uh, making. True, true. No, so I think, you know, this similar sort of questions arose at the time of NREG and in fact you also asked me something to that effect, no? that is it, you know, for, is this a solution, yeah. a longer term solution as well. The way I look at it is that, the, you know, these are small interventions in many ways, but they are important interventions for this season which is that if, think of a poor person today, yeah, what, if you're constantly worried about where is my next meal going to come from, then you're not going to be able to take a longer term view on your life, yeah. So if you're poor and you, you know, the, the monsoon has failed and you do have some patch of land, you just can't feed your family, what would have happened 20 years ago is that you would have migrated with your wife and children to the city in search of work. But when you have something like NREG or PDS in your area, then what happens is that perhaps you can leave your wife and children behind and only you need to go because your wife may get some work on the NREG work site and your family will still be able to survive with the PDS. Yeah? And that in turn allows you to keep your child in school for a much longer period because if you're going to migrate to the city with your children, you have to take them out of school, then getting them back into school may not be easy. So in that sort of way, uh, even the NREG and PDS can be seen as 
an investment in the in the future yeah that by allowing children to remain in school for longer by allow you know protecting people from the uh, you know exposure to ill health in urban centers etc that these programs can play a role in protecting or improving the lives of the next generation yeah, okay um, that's fair enough uh, then uh, my last question on the food security is um, so this is going to cost a lot, right? I think this uh, they estimated around six lakh crores or uh, something like that. One lakh crores. One lakh crores. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so this has to. So where is this going to come from for the government? Is it going to be more taxes or uh, or uh, where will, where do you think it will come from? Well, you know uh, the budget for this uh, food security act, like I said, is one lakh crores. And uh, if you look at the budget document for this last year, the tax revenue foregone of the government of India on their budget website is about 5 lakh crores. Yeah, so these are basically tax breaks that are given to different sorts of industries for you know, promoting these industries, etc. So I feel that if the government they has the political will, then they they should give a few, not remove all the tax breaks, but at least some of the tax breaks can be uh, reduced to some extent to make space for for the Food Security Act. Having said that, uh, let me also say that you know this one lakh crores is about one percent or one point two percent of the GDP. That's the cost of the Food Security Bill, and it's this is what is going to benefit about. 75% of the rural population. Yeah, so I feel it's not a very, you know, put it put in that perspective, considering the number of people it will reach, uh, it doesn't seem like such a big to put 1% of the GDP for 75% of the rural population. Yeah, I think uh, it's uh, it, the hunger issue must be addressed. Uh, there is no second thoughts about it. Um, yeah. So it's, you don't think it's uh, six six lakh crores? I I thought I read it somewhere. No, maybe. No, no. So the uh, so basically the estimates. I mean, the maximum I have seen is one point two lakh crores, one point three lakh crores. But six lakh crores is completely wrong. Okay. I think it's it's the Shobulati figure that you're quoting, but that's not the not the correct figure. Okay, I, I agree. Then um, just the last question I would like to ask um, uh, about uh, the rural issues. One of the issues is uh, toilets and uh, sanitation. And even mm -hmm. in uh, government schools, uh, it's not provided in a lot of villages. And because of which uh, students uh, are not keen on going to the schools, especially girl uh, children. Yeah. So yeah. do you, in, in any of your conversation, do you think uh, this is going to be addressed? Um, so again, you know, sanitation is not something I worked on. Uh, I do have a friend who is uh, working on sanitation at Princeton University. And uh, But you know what you're saying about uh, lack of toilets in schools? I mean, that's obviously, like you say, it's a very serious issue, especially for girls. I mean, um, we ourselves, when we go to these areas, I mean, it's very difficult for us, but we somehow manage. Uh, but I do think that there has been a big improvement in uh, school infrastructure in the past few years. Uh, so the toilets are there. In many cases now they are even functional. I mean, that's another battle, right, that whether, whether they are used or not. Um, but, uh, I mean, I am certainly all in favor of uh, proper toilets in rural areas, uh, you know, whether it's in schools or private homes or whatever it is. Uh, this had become a bit of a focus when uh, Jairam Ramesh was, you know, in charge of sanitation. Uh, but that charge has now been taken away from him. But I think he did uh, he did make a difference to in terms of making this a priority for government. And hopefully that work will carry on. The kind of headlines uh, he made uh, in the last couple of yes. months, do you think that's the reason he was taken out of the... Uh, that role and uh, give it a different one. Maybe that way. Uh, yeah, I doubt it anyway. Yeah. Okay, uh, Ritika ji, uh, uh, thank you very much for spending your time, but before you go, is there anything you want to say? Um, 
perhaps just a small word on this food versus, uh, you know, that there's a big, uh, big, big uh, buzz now in India about replacing all government subsidies with cash transfers. And, you know, when you hear about it, it sounds very appealing. But actually, when you dig a little bit deeper, there are very serious issues, especially in the case of replacing the PDS with cash. Uh, you know, because markets are very far in rural areas, bank penetration is very poor, uh, the, you know, markets are very poorly developed, so people are scared that the two or three traders who are operating in their local market may collude with each other. If there's inflation, you know, whatever cash they get from the government may lose its purchasing power. So I feel that, you know, I was hoping you would ask me something related to cash versus food. Uh, but I would, uh, I think this is, uh, perhaps this is one of my biggest worries with the Food Security Act at the moment is that uh, there will be a big push for replacing food with uh, cash transfers. And I feel today is not a good time to go there. Maybe after 10 years we'll be ready for it. Yeah, that's, uh, I would completely agree. Actually, that's um, it's, uh, maybe not uh, related, but a similar uh, discussion was made in the U.S. elections recently. They said instead of uh, the health care they provide for the for the older people, right. uh, they said yeah, they'll yeah. give you cash directly, then you go and buy wherever you want. Mm -hmm. So that yeah, did not yeah. work. People did not like it. Yeah, this is that Medicaid or whatever right. it's called, no? Yeah. 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 Okay, thank okay, you very thank much. thank you so much. Yeah, it's very kind of you to listen so patiently. <laughs> no, maybe it's uh, late for you and I asked a lot of questions and you answered them all patiently. So thank you very much and uh, I wish okay. you luck in the work that you are doing. Great, thank you. Right. Bye.